Hello listeners, this is Kat, and welcome back to Put Your Hands Up Podfix. This is the continuation of Keep Your Friends Close, As For Your Enemies. This will be Part 5, Chapter 5, entitled Act 5. Two days until deadline. 12.30 p.m., 5 degrees Celsius. Izashi watched his husband as he descended into a worried, agitated mood. Worry, concern, and sleep deprivation had twisted into an attitude even more irritable than usual, and Izashi wasn't sure how long Shota would last. Sho. Shota blinked, shaking his head slightly before he looked up. Zashi. Izashi sat down next to him, looking him in the eye. You're worried. Vent before it gets worse. Shota sighed, putting his head on Izashi's shoulder. The problem children are being brutal, and I think Midori is cracking. Izashi hummed. So, why do you think that? Shota threw his hands up in the air. Those kids... All of them, except for Shinso, have been through villain attack after villain attack, and I've never seen Midoriya break down. I've seen him cry plenty of times. It's practically a habit for him, but there's a difference between crying and that. Shota gestured wildly at the screen. That occupied the wall in front of them. Toward where Midoriya was sitting with his head in his hands, staring blankly into space. I want to grab him by the shoulders and shake him, get him to tell me whatever the hell he's thinking, because that's not like him, and I'm worried, because what the hell... Izashi nodded, rubbing circles into Shota's back. And I'm worried for Shinso, too, because I don't think that he's actually okay with the whole spy thing. He just got into 1A, for goodness sake, and he's already actively betraying the one close friend he has, and I think he's spiraling, too, not as much as Midoriya, but still spiraling, because he's starting to view his own actions as villainous, and you know what kind of shit he's gotten because of his quirk. Ranting seemed to have taken everything out of Shota, as he slumped back against Izashi's side. I just can't help them right now and they clearly need it. Sho, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. They're going through the ringer. And I, frankly, have no idea how this is going to go for both of them. But you're right. We can't do anything right now. All we can do is watch and listen and figure out what it is that we can help them with, okay? Sho decide. Thanks, Sashi. Anytime. One day until deadline. 6.21 a.m. 1 degree Celsius. Kyoka shivered in the cold, holding her hoodie even closer around her. She knew it had been getting cold, but this? This was just insane. Shinso and Shoji seemed to agree, if their shaking hands and clouding breaths were any indication. Even with the extra thermals underneath the hoodie, it was just too cold. Kyoka faintly wondered if Asui had to be moved to a different area because of it. The cold could easily send her into hibernation if they weren't careful. Still, she had to do this, just for a little longer. Then they could all go back to the dorms, have a hot shower, and something warm to drink. They were giving the class the day after the exam off, and she planned to take advantage of that fact. She just had to finish this. Midoriya had been clear with his instructions. They were the distraction. They were to storm the front of the bank with paintball guns, take a bunch of hostages, and hold them while Yagurozu and Hagekori went in through the side to the vault. Tokiyami would guard the back. Midoriya would be watching on one of the cameras. Apparently Hatsume had managed to hack the cameras for this bank, something about low security, and would give them further directions. Shinso, Shoji, and Kyoka shared a moment of eye contact before they all nodded. Time for the show. They all burst in at once, brandishing their paintball guns. Hands in the air! Get down and on the ground! Everyone now! The civilian robots scrambled to obey, somehow understanding the situation despite their limited coding. Kyoka tapped her comms, signaling to the others that it was their turn to go. The villain communication network crackled to life a few moments later, Tokiyami on the line. Mirrors have been sighted two blocks north. I suspect another group has also been sent to circle around from the south. Everyone stay calm. Remember, even if your hostage situation is stopped, form and prism will still be in the building. The hostage situation is a decoy. Right. Tokiyami spoke up again. Todoroki and Kirishima are going to, in to deal with the hostage situation, but I think others are coming. Possibly Bakugo, Ochako, Ashido, and Aoyama. They're coming from behind the building, possibly aiming to block the lower exits. No, not with Uraraka and Kachan. Kachan's a fighter. He'll be aiming to attack somewhere, and Uraraka's probably there for either fighting or closing off higher exits. Form. Prison. What's your status? Midori's voice was dead serious. The security is a lot tighter than expected, especially with the door to the vault. It's sealed with anti-quirk materials. What about Hatsume's laser? Could you make one in time? Not without getting caught, no. One of the hostages tried to get up, and Shoji glared at it, putting a hand on his gun until it sat back down. Midori muttered something that was too quick for them to catch. Withdraw. Your positions are too important. We've already secured enough objectives to pass, and we can work on more if you're not eliminated. Kiyoka started. She was surprised. 
What about Muse? Brachium and me. You withdraw, too. Everyone split up and try to lose the heroes on your way back to the base. Try to avoid engaging in combat, but if you have to, team up to drive them off. There was a sound of furious typing over the line. Prism, sneak out the west window. Don't be seen. Form, go east. Attract as little attention as possible. Remember, the Book of Inventions. Use them, if you think it'll be useful. Kiyoka had almost forgotten about that. She heard a round of affirmative noises from across the line before it went dead, and she was left with Shinzo and Shoji to fend for herself. They wasted no time, going out the front entrance and making a quick break for it, darting through the nearest alleyways they could find. When she reached the end of one alleyway, a familiar figure ran out in front of her. Kiyoka didn't need to say anything for Ida to know her intention. She wanted to get back to the villain base and continue the ruse until the kill protection order was lifted. They couldn't lose this late in the game. Ida bowed his head. That is a logical choice. We'll meet when the battle is over. Ida moved to the side, letting Kiyoka through. It's nothing personal, Midoriya, Kiyoka thought. I had my orders. I was chosen for this mission. So was Shoji, Shinzo, and all the others. I hope you don't hate me for this. One day until deadline. 5.50 p.m., 1 degree Celsius. Kiyoka sat on the rooftop above the alleyway Midori had chosen, unsure of what to do. She, along with most of the others, had been sent out at around 5.30 to go and fill another objective. Hers was to blow up a building. Yayorozu had been intercepted last time, so the task hadn't been completed. But what the others were doing, Kiyoka didn't know. She guessed it wouldn't be an issue, whatever it was. At six o'clock, Nezu's protective rule would be lifted, and Shinso would make the final move, since he had stayed back to defend the base with Midoriya. She couldn't drop the ruse when they were so close to finishing this. Then she heard something in the wind, something that even she had to strain to hear. It sounded like some kind of wind instrument, maybe a flute, or was it a recorder? But no, that couldn't be it, because it was playing too many notes at once. Bagpipes, then? The noise got louder, still barely audible over the violent wind, and the ambient noise made it sound distant. Kyoka paled when she realized what it was. She reached for her comms. Code word dastardly. Earphone Jack here, requesting immediate backup around the southwest corner of the city. I'm hearing music from a pipe organ, probably a calliope, coming from an unidentifiable source, maybe multiple sources. It's the kind you'd hear at a circus. No reply. This is Earphone Jack, requesting immediate backup. Do you read me? Static came from the other end of the line. Please, can anyone hear me? I think... Kyoka cut herself off, hearing something other than static over the comms. It was faint, and even with advanced hearing, she struggled to hear it, but after a moment, it got louder and her eyes widened in horror. The music was playing over the comms unit, rapidly growing in volume. Quick, she had to think. The music playing over the comms meant that the system was compromised, and trying to contact the heroes wasn't going to help. The music was getting louder, so loud that her ears were beginning to hurt, after it hit a particularly bad note, she ripped her comms off, deciding that preserving her hearing was more important than a chance of contacting someone on her team over the wire. She'd have to deliver the message herself, then. But the music outside of the comms was growing, too, and Kyoka was struggling to think above the echo. She stumbled, just managing to not fall off of a building, before she collapsed onto the roof. She felt the splatter of something cold and thick across her back, and brought a hand around to see what it was. Bright pink paint came off her fingertips. The music stopped. One day until deadline. 5.57 p.m. 1 degree Celsius. Izuka traced the rim of his mug nervously, facing the mirror in the kitchen. Exactly why there was a mirror in the kitchen was entirely unknown, but there it was, sitting just above the sink for no apparent reason. It's not a bad idea to have a mirror in a kitchen per se, but it made little sense. Oh, he was rambling again. The kill protection would be lifted in. He glanced at the clock on the wall. Two minutes now. He had sent Jiro, Shoji, Tokiyami, Hagekura, and Yayorozu out on a separate mission, despite their desire to stay. No, Izuku had plans for tonight. They were not a part of them. Izuku checked the time again. One minute. Izuku put his mug down and waited as the remaining seconds ticked down, the clock on the wall working his already frayed nerves into a frenzy. Six o'clock. What are you doing? Shinzo's voice was not unkind, though Izuku supposed it never was. He almost wished it was this time. Waiting. There was a moment of silence before Izuku smirked, conscience switching off as his heart broke again. What? Is your quirk not working? A glance in the mirror confirmed that Shinzo was sheet pale, staring at him with wide, dark eyes. Izuku turned around, looking at him face to face rather than just a reflection. How are you doing that? Oh, Izuku raised an eyebrow, leaning up against the counter behind him with a relaxed posture. Stopping you from using your quirk? 
Yes. Shinzo was tense, poised like a live wire, adrenaline flowing faster and further than his own blood. Your voice changer. It has a digital mode. Izuku bared his teeth in an imitation of a smile. Remotely activated. Building the switch into the design had been hard, according to Hatsume, a small, discreet mic and speaker no more powerful than the voice itself, which he could flick on and off. After all, Shinzo's quirk didn't work over a digital transfer, such a powerful quirk, so easily neutralized. You knew. It wasn't a question. Yes. Since when? Since always. Izuku held out his hand, starting to list out the names. I know about you, Shoji, Jiro, Tokiyami, Hagakure, Yagirozu, and— Oh, I guess that's all of you. Izuku giggled, pressing a hand to his lips in the mockery of a polite gesture. His eyes were bright. I knew. The whole time. Shinso's eyes widened, and he reached for his comms. Team Mole, report now. Izuku's smile widened, knowing that Shinso was getting nothing more than the buzz of static. Shoji, Jiro, Tokiyami, Hagakure, Yagirozu, we've been found out. Please respond. Izuka simply watched as Shinzo became more desperate, calling out for his teammates over and over again with no response but maddening, mocking static. After a few moments, Shinzo noticed that Izuka's shoulders were shaking with laughter. Shinzo watched in growing horror as Izuka struggled to breathe. What did you do? The laughter died down, and Izuka waved a hand dismissively. I had Hatsume deal with them. She was more than happy to test out some new traps. Shinzo shook his head. If I can't use my quirk, I can use other weapons. He pulled out his paintball gun, pointing it at Izuku, and Izuku cocked his head to the side. Oh, and are you going to shoot? Yes. Then go ahead. Just try. Izuku's voice was barely a whisper, taunting and sweet. Shinso paused. This is a trick, isn't it? Izuku clapped a mockery of the innocent smile Shinso thought he knew, plastered across his face like plastic. Gold star to Itoshi Shinso. It's rigged to backfire. His smile turns night again. Or is it? Neither of them drew attention to the fact that Shinso's gun was shaking. Shinso flipped the gun around, so the barrel was facing his chest. If it backfires, you get hit. Izuku laughed out loud, almost startling Shinso into pulling the trigger. Do you have any idea what you look like right now? Shaking, terrified, pressing the barrel of your gun to your own chest. There was something so exhilarated and Izuku's tone so reverent that it made Shinso sick to the stomach. Izuku's eyes were wide, his pupils dilated, and he was leaning forward slightly as if captivated by the display. This... this wasn't Midoriya. It couldn't be. In that moment, Shinso spotted the gun lying on the table next to him, just carded left behind. Tokiyami's, probably. He made a split-second decision, lunged for it, pointing it at Izuku and pulled the trigger. The room fell into silence as black paint dripped down Shinso's chest, the smile fell off Izuka's face as he turned away toward the mirror and pulled out a makeup kit. He started to apply some foundation to his face as Shinso stood there in disturbed silence. Finally, Shinso spoke. How did you know? His voice was small. Because you're logical. The gun was compromised. You grab a new one. Not that, he said, the sound barely audible over the oppressive silence that had settled over the room like a blanket. How did you know I was a spy? Izuku paused, before continuing. Because I know what it's like to need to prove yourself. Joining the hero team was your best option, and if they told you to spy on me, well, it would gain you a modicum of respect, however small. It was obvious. Silence. Shinso reached up, unclasping his voice changer. He looked at it for a moment. It unclasps. He looked down. Wouldn't it have been more logical for it to lock? Izuku continued what he was doing without pause. I'm not that kind of a monster, Shinso. He reached down and grabbed a small box that had been carefully squirreled away in a bottom drawer, opening it to reveal a pair of purple contacts. Shinso started shaking his head, growing agitated. This whole thing, the lies, the secrets, the plots, the traps, it's not... It's not what, Shinso? Izuku whirled around, voice sharp. Not heroic, not fair. I think we've both crossed that line. Shinso just stared at Izuku for a long moment before answering. It's not you. Izuku turned back around. Then maybe I'm not quite who you think. He kept talking, idle chatter to fill the silence after it became too heavy. I did some research into the exam. In past, 
I tried to explain it, but Dark Shadow cut me off before I could say anything of value. You know that eleventh objective I mentioned? Shinso didn't answer. It was identity theft. And that's a weird objective to put in an exam like this. Limited people, limited time, limited resources, limited space to single people out. I see why they removed it, but it got me thinking. Izuka put the purple contacts in, blinking to let them settle. Why was it included in the first place? I think it was Nezu's idea of encouragement. He wanted to subtly suggest to the villains that they needed to think of creative ways to win. He took a spare voice changer out, one of Shinso's, and put it on, lifting his hood to cover his hair. Then he turned around and Shinso was met with his own face staring back at him. Why did you ask me to be on your team? Shinso blurted out the question suddenly coming to him. Why did you come to me if you knew I was only going to betray you? Izuku gave him a bitter smile and started walking toward the door. You know the saying. Keep your friends close. Izuku stepped out of the door, his next words barely a murmur. As for your enemies... The door clicked shut behind him, and Shinzo was left in complete and utter silence. All right, listeners, this concludes Chapter 5 of Keep Your Friends Close. As for your enemies, Chapter 6 will be next, just two more chapters to go for this one. I hope you all enjoyed this chapter, it's one of my favorites, and as always, thank you so much for listening.